Uh, I'm Seth Andrew. Thank you for having me with this uh, esteemed group. I should just say explicitly that I'm not in my official capacity. You can tell that because I'm wearing a yellow baseball cap. And in government, uh, you have to sign a form that says this is outside activity, not your actual official capacity uh, to, to talk about revolution and movements. Uh, so I am in my outside capacity. I have signed the forms. I am off the clock. And I am here in my role as revolutionary, not government and official. Uh, here, so, here, 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 here. There is a role for government to play, but it is, uh, it is not to lead the revolution, uh, which has to be from the ground. So, so. I'm going to talk about the second bounce and no excuses and what technology is going to do for us in this work that we do in, in changing schools. And the first thing to remember when we're here in a room like this is that we have a crisis in America of unfathomable proportions for most people in this room, even those of us that work in schools, because most of us who do work in pretty good schools. But 9% of American low-income kids are getting a, a college degree, 9%. And so when we talk about reform, we're talking about the wrong thing. Because if we double that, we're still broken. If we triple that, we're broken. If we quintuple that, we are broken. We need a revolution, not reform. And it bothers me even more when we talk about this revolution because any other public system in America that had a 91% failure, failure rate we would see a revolution. If 91% of the time your trash didn't get picked up, there'd be a revolution. If 91% of the air traffic controllers made mistakes, there'd be a revolution. If 91% of the time you turned on the faucet, the water came out polluted and dirty, there'd be a revolution. And yet in urban communities in America today and for the past 10 decades, only 9% at best. When Dr. Du Bois talked about the talented 10th, he didn't mean a ceiling. He meant a floor and a leadership and the beginning <coughs> of a movement. But to truth, the truth is, we're not a movement. We need a paradigm shift. It can't just be about beating the odds, which is what No Excuses 1.0 was really about, beating the odds. It needs to be about changing the odds, mm -hmm. rethinking what we're doing. And so we have to change the odds, not just for a couple lucky, lucky kids that get in our lottery, but as Kevin says, by any means necessary. And so we have to have a paradigm shift that takes us to the next step. And so in my next chapter, we're going to be working on this alumni revolution. Because the idea of the second bounce is that we've started to seed the grassroots. Right? Grassroots don't happen without grass seeds. And we've started to seed the grassroots with scholars who are now in college actually changing those numbers themselves, and they are sprouting. And that's the alumni revolution that we're going to start to see. And so I'm excited to see this revolution start to begin because, as Kevin says better than I, we are not a movement yet. Movements are authentically led grassroots up. They are not policy initiatives top down from the elites. They have to first develop human capacity and tools and then the policy proposals. And we've done it all the backwards. We started with the policy proposals. We started with the long-term plans and the studies and the, develop, the, the, the plan for the plans and the study of the studies and the debate the debates. And we need to be thinking about planting the seeds for the grassroots. And so technology is one of those seeds that is now finally here to help to transform the work that we've done. And it's only a question of how soon, not if. It may be the tool we're waiting for, and we're starting to see it around the world in low-income communities and in low-income countries. So we know this can now be done. We just have to harness that tool to transform what No Excuses 1.0 was, which was planting the seeds with little ones who are now becoming the revolutionaries of the next generation. So in 1.0, we did five things. We did joyous culture, more time, increased rigor, thoughtful data, and inspiring talent. And we put that package together in the high-performing charter sector. And there's lots of people in this room who've had done, done work in these schools. And they're amazing. And democracy prep is one, but there are many others. And 1.0 showed what's possible. But we've seen great results only in some pockets, tiny numbers by a, a nation with as many kids as we have. And so we've started to see those results validated externally, and yet we're not seeing the big impacts, in part because we're still spending our money and thinking about things in all the wrong ways. We're still thinking, and this is Dr. Fryer's research at Harvard, a great economist, we're still spending our money and thinking about class size and per pupil expenditures and teachers with certification and teachers with master's degrees. And even this morning in a revolutionary talk that we heard, we heard the, this complaint about, oh, we're not getting enough money to our poor schools. Well, actually, we're getting a lot more money in a lot of our poor schools. So this is about how we're spending money, how we're spending time, how we're spending talent, not just how much of it there is. And that instead, if we use technology as the tool to move into on things like teacher feedback and data-driven instruction and tutoring and instructional time and high expectations, and we leverage those tools, we're going to see a much bigger second bounce that if we try to do the same things and do more of it than we've done in the past. And so you can do this on less money. 
And that's not the barrier that we have today. It shouldn't be based on money. It should be based on a movement that didn't require Dr. King to have philanthropy from all the foundations in the world. <laughs> that wasn't what built a movement. What built a movement were the alumni. And so two, No Excuses 2.0, and Dr. Fuller says this well, he told, you know, No Excuses shouldn't be no empathy. And it's not No Excuses for kids. We always meant it as No Excuses for adults. So 2.0 is transitioning each of these things. So from 1.0, we went to try to change structures. Now we need to change mindsets. In 1.0, we were generally punitive. In 2.0, we need to be purposeful. In 1.0, we were in a startup culture, an entrepreneurial culture. Now we need to be thinking about turning around existing systems. So Democracy Prep has now taken over and turned around two uh, of the lowest performing charter schools in Camden and Harlem. We're now about to do another one in Democracy Prep to show that this can work for every kid, that it's the adults that are the problem, not the kids, not the community, not the family, not the poverty. It's the adults that are doing the wrong thing. In 1.0, we were founding schools. Now we need to be transitioning to new leaders and new leadership. In 1.0, we were talking about high school completion. We now need to be talking about college completion, not to college, but through college. In 1.0, we still use an agricultural schedule. And we need to be now thinking about a technological schedule. We don't all work in like, you know, from 8 o'clock to 3 p.m. Even in the charter world, we're like, hey, yeah, we're 8 o'clock to 4 p.m. now, right? <laughs> uh, that is not the way the world works anymore. We need to be thinking about technological time and not agricultural time. In 1.0 in, in rigor, we were talking about proficiency. And we need to be now measuring growth for every single child, not proficiency. The press releases that drive me the most crazy are say 100% of our kids were proficient in blah, blah, blah. And they forget to tell you the denominator of the kids that left or were counseled out. And they're not measuring the individual growth. What if all the kids walked in? I went to Bronx Science. It's a great school by external demographic reputation and everything else. And it sucks as a school. But they just take the high performing kids and they put them with low performing teachers and claim success. And what we need to be taking is low performing kids when they walk in the door, giving them high performing teachers, and then claiming real success by giving and creating alumni revolutionaries. In 1.0, we had static measures. We need dynamic measures. We use bubble tests. We're moving to adaptive tests. We used to be cohort-based in the No Excuses movement. Now we need to be mastery-based and personalized instead of based on 25 kids at a time. In 1.0, we were working on averages. An average of our kids did blah, blah, blah. Right? What's our average SAT score? Now we need to be mastery-based. We used to put up our data on the wall on paper and say, that's our data wall. <laughs> and I remember going to a great school that had da a data wall. And it was literally seven month old data. But they were really proud to bring me to their data wall. Um, and now we can actually think about machine learning. We need to move from spreadsheets to visualize data from analog to digital. We need to be moving from credentialing to authentic diversity, from certification to competent and humble leaders, from bonuses to performance steps. All these things that we've learned now in 1.0, the second bounce is going to take us to 2.0. And what we did at Democracy Prep in 1.0 was different. We also tried to add these three things in addition to the no excuses culture. We operated on public funds for all scholars with authentic civics. So that also has to change. In 1.0, most no excuses schools relied on philanthropy. Even when they said they didn't, they were lying. We have to think about how do we do this on the dollars that exist. We have to think not about top-down budgets, but actually about bottom-up budgets. Where do you start with your money, at the superintendent or at the teacher? We need to be thinking about stop doing the triage and austerity conversations and focus first on what's most important. So the kinds of triage that we do at the end of the day, are we going to take 50 kids to Africa or 20 kids to Africa? Because that's the last thing that we're going to decide. That's at the very end of the process, not at the beginning. And then we have to move away from competitive funding to zero baseline funding, which is just a different way of thinking about money. And 2.0, in the model for No Excuses 1.0, we use separate applications from every charter school in New York City. So if you're a family, you have to fill out 180 charter school applications for 180 different lotteries. We need to go to common applications, as they've done in Denver and Newark and New Orleans, soon hopefully in New York. We used to have less IEP and LEP students. Now we need to have more LEP students. We used to counsel out students. Now we have to have replacement from K to 12. We used to have a lottery once a year. Now we need to be doing the same thing district schools do, which is take all kids all the time, whenever they come from wherever they come. And if we're not doing that, how can we compare ourselves to the public schools that are? So there are a lot of things that we have to do, but the most important to me in Second Bounce is the authentic civic work of our alumni revolutionaries. We need to give them the knowledge, the skills, and the dispositions to actually not just react, but to be proactive and regular in our civic authentic engagement. We need to be focused on the demand side and cultivating the reformers and the reform that Kevin talked about so eloquently. We need to be moving away from policy towards movement building, from a PTA and a student government association to actual genuine engagement by our students, families, and alumni in the real work of reform to build a movement. And the good news, and I ask you all to leave here with this, is that we are not a movement yet, but we can be. 
because we've planted a whole lot of seeds in the work over the last 10 years since I've been coming to this conference. And there are seeds now ready to sprout to turn into the revolutionaries. And right now, 9% of the kids in America are low income are going to graduate from college no matter what we do. If we add the data from the early no excuses schools, we get to about 33, maybe 40%. That leaves 67% of low-income Americans who are part of the revolutionary culture that is about to come if we give them the tools and human capacity and the development they need to take it to the next level, to be the revolutionaries on their college campuses and beyond. And that, to me, is the second bounce. It's taking these scholars in Harlem, in Camden, in DC, all over the country, and turning them into revolutionaries, giving them the tools they need to actually lead us so that they're the ones setting the world on fire. Thank you very much.